Welcome everyone, welcome to Bitcoin and the banking crisis. We've had, what a year in US banking, of course. And what we're gonna talk about to get going here is really the contrast that we've seen from Bitcoin, Bitcoin industry, industry players, Bitcoin products, and what we've seen in the actual banking sector and all of the bankruptcies and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, the first question I have along the lines of that everything to do with this crisis is really about the reputation of U.S. commercial banks, globally, domestically. How, what's gone on with this reputation? How, how much has it changed from what we saw in 08 with the crisis then to what we're seeing this year? So it's really about the reputation of U.S. commercial banks. So Mike, I'll, I'll start with you. I think it's undeniable that uh, this year has been pivotal in terms of the reputation of the banks. So we saw that the risk management inside of these firms is not as professional as you think it is. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I think banks have one job. I give you the money, I come back later, you give it back to me. It's as simple as that, right? Um, and here we have a situation where, you know, they're managing how to make a profit. And so they're trying to put that money to work. We, we think of banks as depositories, as lending institutions that distribute money out through our communities and help make small business happen and all that. No, it turns out we printed a lot of money, they didn't have enough loan demand, so instead they park it into these long-term T-bills. And then everybody knows eventually the interest rates are gonna go up. What's gonna happen when this occurs? And you know, somehow they got on the wrong side of this. So all of a sudden the reputation is really tainted, right? We expect that these banks, the bedrock of our financial system, are safe places for consumers, for businesses alike. We saw in Silicon Valley, all these investors, you know, they give money to small companies to go make things happen. They might get a check for 20 million or 25. They say, founders, your job is to go operate your business. Your job is not to invest this. Your job is to put it in the bank and go operate. And so we depended on those banks to take good care of that money. And it turns out they're not as good of a steward as we think. So big reputational damage. You know, one, one thing that you made me think of, and this will be a question for you, David. Um, when you talk, you know, indeed, interest rate risk is sort of banking 101, kind of forgotten about over years. But one of the things we've seen for the past, let's say, 30 years, this was a historical anomaly where the best and brightest for an entire generation went to Wall Street, worked for banks. Now, one thing we noticed that when Kraken and other Bitcoin institutions began, and started hiring, we really saw a massive human capital drain out of the system. And I'll say that, you know, people who have been in the Bitcoin space, we've seen some of the most talented people because there was real risk, there was real trading. It wasn't all backstopped by um, what was going on in Wall Street. I've often called it like, because they de-risked Wall Street with the bailouts in 08, sort of like making it porno. It's not real. There's no more real risk, right? Now, what you guys have got, you know, tons of talent. The best and brightest have really gone into a place like Kraken where they've been known to hire these top people. Do you see that? Do you, do you think it is one of those cases where we didn't notice that the best and brightest left Wall Street and have already joined some of the institutions like Kraken? Is that something you've seen with all the hiring you guys have done and, and that kind of stuff? Yeah, there's probably an aspect of that. I mean, I think, I mean, I definitely agree with, with Mike on the, the transparency that's now out there for, among a lot of people on kind of how the financial system works and some of the implications of these challenges. I mean, it's frankly what, you know, us Bitcoiners here have always known about what could happen. And all of a sudden, the events that we knew would always be possible, they happen. And so uh, a lot of these things are kind of like laid out in, uh, you know, plain sight in front of everybody, and they're like, wow, okay, okay, banks can actually fail, and in, in, in what happens when they do fail? Where does the, the backstop come from? Where does the protection come from? Uh, the FDIC, oh wait, no, that actually doesn't really cover all the deposits, and they really only have a couple percent coverage on your funds anyways, and on down the line, and you, they, they, all of these things that we've talked about, and that we knew about e even before you know, true Bitcoin, even before Bitcoin existed, now are becoming more and more transparent and known to everybody. And I think, you know, sorry to bring it back to your point around talent. Um, I think, you know, you probably see a, a variety, I mean, Wall Street, geez, I mean, we're talking about, what, tens, hundreds of thousands, millions even, different individuals working in the space. And, um, you know, 
all different walks, different perspectives, uh, different motivations. And I think for sure, I mean, there are some talented individuals out there that understand all the fundamental principles, you know, at a first principles basis of, you know, financial services and finance and interest rates and risk and all these different pieces. And, and some of them actually are kind of, you know, in some ways true um, uh, individuals that kind of like adhere to the true ideals of Bitcoin and crypto and are attracted to it. That's kind of like that Venn diagram of, of folks that I think have, have come to join Kraken, mm -hmm. um, you know, the handful that we, we have at, uh, at, at the company. So, um, you know, a lot of this reputation decreasing, let's say, uh, also has a, a, a correlated aspect to it because the power of the U.S. regulatory system was really predicated on the reputation of U.S. banking system being the best in the world. Now, the idea of power and reputation being connected in this way, with the reputation going down, we have seen, I think, a diminishment in the power of the U.S. regulatory state. They're doing stuff, but you're starting to see people say, well, I got options. There's other things I can do. So, Mike, is that something that rings true to you? Do you, do you see now that the, the, the power, you know, it, when Alan Greenspan spoke at the Fed years ago, every, the world stopped. We all listened. When Jerome Powell gets up there now, we're saying, like, look at him twitch. <laughs> why is he so weird? Why is he, why is he acting like that? Well, look, I think it's... Uh, history of mankind, the power and money go together. Mm -hmm. And those of us, and I think many of the people here have been in the Bitcoin space, you know, 10 years now. And a lot of what attracts us to the space is the idea that, hey, wait a minute, the power has shifted a little bit far away from the people. That isn't actually what we wanted. Uh, and, and Bitcoin looks like an opportunity to say, how do we rebuild that? Um, back to the personnel question a moment ago, I think the folks on Wall Street, you know, they, they're supposed to manage money, but they don't actually produce anything and what's happening in the crypto tech sector is we're actually building new products and bringing new people and putting everybody on the same you know kind of same transparent playing field so the people that know how to build and put systems together are the people that know how to do that and that's why we see technology coming in and then I think most people this rabbit hole we go down to we realize wow there's a lot of messy stuff that was invented you know 50 60 years ago with how we do our current money system mm -hmm. and that could be done a lot better and we're definitely not happy with the balance of power as a people. So yes, the dollar is weakening. Of course, that, uh, that weakens the power that goes along with that money. But even you know, the, the idea of like a contrasting business model, let's say, is starting to become obvious. You know, running a fractional reserve system where it's all maturity transformation of loans to people. They're, they're basically, they've got like a subscription base of mortgage holders at this point. Like that's the, the, you know, on the retail side of banking, right? They have this. You know, like with banks, the, the, this idea of, you know, regional banks providing lending in their space. Okay. It used to be like we didn't have the internet. We couldn't communicate across the nation instantly. Now we can. You get a mortgage today. Mm -hmm. The ink's not even dry before that mortgage is packaged up, sold to somebody else, it's getting repackaged into a security mm -hmm. of all kinds, right? You know, this idea, do we need regional banks to do lending? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's historic, right? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it really what we need? You can get on the internet, you can get a loan all, all over the place. You get it from a, abroad. You don't need it necessarily. Mm -hmm. And then, so on the lending side, I'm not sure the premise of what banks used to do in terms of being lenders is actually as needed as it used to be. And then second, keep the money safe. Mm -hmm. And you know they used to give you a yield by way of lending it out. As a result of the money, poli the monetary policy from the Fed, that went down to zero. Mm -hmm. So now you're just giving an unsecured loan to this bank and trusting them that they're going to do something responsible with it. And now it's been revealed that responsibility was breached. So we, we definitely saw Bitcoin react price-wise, but I wonder if this sort of um, you know activity around reputation and the contrast with business models. Have you seen that as an opportunity where people come in and you now see a clear avenue to grow your business simply because of the contrast of the bank system failing and uh, what we're offering seemingly more confidence despite the troubles on the other side? Is that something you've perceived in the company? Do you see that you know, up and down? Do you, do you see new customers coming in with new stories, yeah. new origin stories of, of people joining? And I don't mean professionally, joining as customers of your service. Yeah, for sure. So, I, I mean, I think there's a, a very kind of like recent near-term uh, you know, story around this, and then there's kind of the long-term one that we've already talked about. The recent and near-term story is, 
you know, Kraken's a, a bridge from, you know, this, this legacy system to the new system, right? And, uh, you know, when these various banks, you know, rumors started, some of these banks, of course, were banks that crypto um, investors, funds, and so forth were using. Uh, they questioned the safety of their U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. They uh, questioned the safety of the banks that they were using. And in some instances, they may have went from a case where they, you know, had a bank, uh, or several banks, and they got down to a situation where they had just one, mm -hmm. as opposed to many, or even zero. And what happened, many of these uh, individuals, businesses, what have you, Kraken clients, mm -hmm. they rotated away from US dollars into, into, into Bitcoin, uh, and, and stable coins to some extent, in, 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 which is a little bit of a different dynamic. And so we actually saw that in the near term when the um, more recent uh, kind of spate of different, you know, bank shutdowns, failures, depending on which one we're talking about, happened. So we actually saw it in a very like isolated uh, near-term aspect. This like rotation, you know, among our client base out of out of fiat, out of U.S. dollars. Um, but it's really a microcosm of you know the, this long-term transition that um, you know as individuals kind of see the contrast between the two different systems. You have the system with, you know, kind of the uncertain uh, set of rules, um, you know, you change, changes in monetary policy, changes in the just, you know, the supply of this particular currency, the US dollar, changes in rules on who can transact, whether that's sanctions or whatever else. And then you see Bitcoin, which is, you know, much more deterministic, at least today, in terms of supply, in terms of ability to transact, all these different types of things that contrast in, you know, the, the, the inevitable, um, Kind of realization among many people that hey this this other system has a lot of clear benefits now the system certainly has those benefits like you said right you can see the contrast but i'll go back to the predictability part for a second right so bitcoiners have predicted the world we're in now for years we predicted the banking thing years ago if you go back to the repo rumble in 2019 you know we were laughed at for saying oh well it's either going to continue with this overnight repo market and you're gonna have to have a massive print. We didn't know anything about COVID, but the print happened, right? We saw it all happen. So, you know, we, we've been predicting things pretty accurately for over 10 years now. But at the same time, if you go back to these business models, we haven't been able to have a predictable partner as an industry when it comes to negotiating the, the legal regimes that we can operate in and create products in and things like that. You know, I'm reminded of the OCC guidance in 2020 for custodians like yourself, where they said, actually, this is an, basically an ancient practice of banks. You can do it, don't worry about it, right? And this is in 2020. And within months, uh, you got rug pulled. Uh, actually, you need a whole new set of rules. We gotta create a codified system just for you. So we're dealing with being the right predictors of the environment, yet having no predictable um, partner when it comes to regulatory things. So how frustrating has that been for you to operate in that environment? No predictability when all your predictions are right. Well, look, I think some of that is, is fair, but I think we should also be fair to those that are new to technology. We have completely upended the way to think about money. And so it's natural that it's going to take a lot of education to make that work. We have now completely upended the way these systems can come together. You know, you go and ask executives at Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, like what would be an ideal market structure for trading systems, banks, et cetera? And they can't tell you, they don't think that way. Mm. They know very well how the existing system works. It's the rules of the road, but they don't think about how do you change the rules to make it be better. They're just not that type of person. They don't have that power anyway. Um, so yes, it's very frustrating that you know, we don't have like just a clear, clean road, but we shouldn't be surprised because power and money overlap. We shouldn't be surprised because it actually is mm -hmm. technologically upending. We shouldn't be surprised because neither the regulators, the legislators, or the existing Wall Street incumbents are very good at building systems. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we shouldn't be surprised. It can take a long they're, time. They're not systems thinkers is what you're saying. They're definitely not. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, but at the same time, you know, the, the products that Kraken, for example, has tried to bring to market, like the through the SPDI, for example. So the whole idea of um, not having a creditor-debtor relationship when you make deposits into a bank. So the, the whole point of the SPDI is that you can hold things in bailment, which is exactly how the repo market works, right? The, the Fed, when it deals with 
the commercial banks is actually using the bailment structure because they don't want to create a debtor-creditor relationship with overnight lending and want to be able to have free and clear, unencumbered assets going between the two. And now, you know, you build this product, which in combination with proof of reserves, which, which would be a, a, an amazing thing, uh, put those together and you would have probably a product that would solve most of the problems that people have with you know, risk of, of, of a bank and worrying about a bank crisis. Yep. But in your case, you had the thing done, you did everything right, and you didn't get the predictable outcome that it looked like you'd earned. So yep. in your case, you have a whole set of different frustrations. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the frustrations you're referring to are basically the, you know, the, the, the Fed and the master count and the ability mm -hmm. to, you know, have this thing granted and, and so forth. And yes, that's been like an ongoing, um, ongoing ordeal. I think I'll leave it to Caitlin to, <laughs> to tell that story. She could tell it, you tell it quite well. But I mean, I think we, you know, we're focusing now, you know, with the SPDI, not on, not on the fiat side, which we, you know, were previously and focusing strictly more so on the crypto side uh, with that, with that, uh, uh, you know, that entity and business, which we're, you know, uh, you know, looking to launch in the, the coming months here. Uh, we're focusing strictly on the crypto side. It goes a little bit to the piece on bailment, but like, I would say some of the aspects that we just really, really find attractive about it is, you know, a regulator that is like really um, leaning into crypto and is very much uh, interested in learning about crypto. Um, you know, they passed a handful of like specific laws related to Bitcoin and crypto with regard to, you know, forks, airdrops, uh, these types of things. And so those aspects we, we think are, you know, particularly interesting. You know, frankly, just the kind of, um, you know, warmness around Bitcoin and crypto uh, just from, a, you know, kind of a, a ba baseline standpoint. And then, yeah, some of these other specific things we think might be, you know, interesting and so forth. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, I know there's different structures on the Belmont piece, but it's not like the, the most critical aspect, I guess, for, for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about proof of reserves? What about it? Like, uh, as far as a, a, an interesting product that can yeah. help yeah, so, so proof of reserves, and by the way, Kraken is, I think, probably leading maybe better than anybody on this, so good job. Um, so proof of reserves first came out as a, a concept, you know, what, 2014, 15, kind of uh, after the Mt. Gox uh, episodes. The great thing is when you have the digital assets and when you hold in 100% reserve, you can do proof of reserves. It doesn't work with a fractional system. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work with a fiat system where you can't see it on chain. So, uh, you know... Obviously, what we're building here is trying to be more transparent so that you can identify risk, you can identify fraud and failures. Um, proof of reserves will help tremendously with that. It's probably more important than the bailment thing that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what's happening in our industry? Do we have a case where, you know, you put it into a 100% reserve bank or qualified custodian where you've got it bankruptcy remote and then suddenly the courts are pulling it away from you? No, no, no. Segregated accounts or bankruptcy remote, that's always been true. There's zero examples of any custodian in the U.S. ever where client funds are taken mm -hmm. and given to somebody else. So that doesn't happen. But the rug pull? Mm -hmm. Well, that's been happening a lot, right? Uh, so anyway, I think the proof of reserves is, is far more important. Yeah. But market structure is coming together. And every regulator, you know, Wyoming or whatnot, mm -hmm. that puts something specific forward uh, for how crypto should engage is always good. Always good. Now, Sorry. Yeah, I just I'm proof, proof of reserves. I mean, it, it it is a you know a a positive step you know to do these types of things to add transparency and so forth. But like, um, you know, we're we're the first to say they're not perfect. You know, there's still the, the <laughs> proof of reserves that we have. There's you know, still an auditor involved, a third party audit, which is a positive as opposed to not using an auditor mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. which is what we see um, you know from many of the others you know out there claiming proof of reserves and so. Um, there's still a number of different things there. You still have to like, you know, have some type of process. Are you really identifying all of the liabilities out there? Uh, you know, that, that these assets need to, need to, to back all of the, the customer claims and what have you. So, um, you, while challenges, I mean, I think, you know, the, all of these steps towards more and more transparency are, you know, what we should be doing in the, the, the space of this kind of like uh, mushy middle of, mm -hmm. hey, you know, there's crypto, Bitcoin, non-custodial, that's the ideal. That's where we want everyone to eventually be. Uh, but, you know, custodians are going to serve a purpose, you know, for, for some time and maybe, maybe for a long time, you know, as we kind of do this, you know, long transition from one system to the next.
And you know, e even the idea of proof of reserves as part of a, a system and people understanding that the system is changing a lot like what you were saying, right? We're, we're looking at systems here, not the, the goals of Wall Street or whatever. The systems that we use to transact, to make commercial relationships, to you know, form these commercial relationships that can move the world forward with all kinds of inventions and stuff like that. So you know, as someone who's more from the tech side, as an engineer, having to deal with financial engineers for a long time, uh, do you see actual engineering uh, literacy, let's say, because of Bitcoin entering the fray more and, and people who are working in the financial engineering side now opening their eyes to this sort of tech, the real engineering side of things? Well, I mean, look at proof of work, right? There's been a tremendous amount of debate around, mm -hmm. you know, what is proof of work and it's environmentally bad. And, you know, I guess it's more coming from the political side mm -hmm. of really having a hard time understanding it. You know, we gave it names like mining, which connotes other things, so there's, there's a lot of confusion there. But coming back to like trading and markets, right? So if you look at the, I'll call it the legacy equities markets, right? You'll find you know, a series of brokers, you'll find exchanges, you'll find clearing houses. Um, these were designed to help people trade fast. Now, we do need, by the way, lots of liquidity in any market. We need that, whether it's a Bitcoin market or anything else. But do we need clearing houses the way we had them in the past? Well, we have technology that can come in and solve these problems. So this idea of like at atomically moving the money in the mm -hmm. TradFi world, they call this DVP, right? Uh, delivers payment. But we can build systems that handle that perfectly, and the technology disallows the edge case of anybody failing on, the, on their Like life. a velocity of money situation, uh, where it's, it's going to the real economy and not the, the scalped economy of let me get a bit off the top and, and all that stuff. Well, that gets into the high, higher levels. No, I'm talking about just like how do you clear trades? Like you do all this trading back and forth and then we clear it. Mm -hmm. And then there's manual systems that, that deal with that. And it's not guaranteed. So somebody has to be a fiduciary. And if somebody doesn't show up with their money, he, mm -hmm. you know, he has to step in and, and backstop it. Mm -hmm. With crypto, we can get rid of that entirely. Mm -hmm. And it's just two people trading. And the money's either going to swap or it's not. P to P. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so look, we can build much better markets than what we had. Mm -hmm. But the people that are running the legislative and regulatory bodies today don't really understand why mm -hmm. we have the market structure we have. Mm -hmm. And they certainly don't understand the possible of what technology can do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And here we're just talking about trading in markets kind of on the level one spot markets, but there's a lot more mm -hmm. kind of beyond it. So, and you, you made a good point just about the, the, the predictability of these systems, but also just, you know, here we are, we can predict where this is headed. So David, where, where do you think we're headed with this bank crisis in the next, few months, a few years, and we'll, we'll, we'll lead out with that. Yeah, it's an interest, interesting time, interesting place for, uh, I guess, the Fed and these banks to be. You have this dynamic where it's rocking a hard place, right? You have looking at you know, more bank failures on one side or, or inflation on the other side, and I, I don't know how they're going to be able to thread the needle, frankly. Mm -hmm. We'll have to see. But um, Fortunately for us, we don't need to really think too hard about it because we have Bitcoin uh, as our news. path. That's the good news. What about you, Mike? A couple of predictions here. Well, I'll try to be, be optimistic about it. Um, this has become too political. I hope everybody here can help kind of bring this away from politics because, frankly, this is about money. Mm -hmm. And if we turn it away from, you know, I'm pro Bitcoin or I'm pro power or whatever, and instead say, I'm pro human rights, mm. and I care about people having the right to receive money, save money, and later spend it on whatever they want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If we make that happen, I think Democrats should love it, Republicans, Libertarians should love it. Mm -hmm. Like, focus on that, help the politicians, you know, disarm that this is a political issue. It's not, mm -hmm. it's a human issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be uh, a great outcome. The Bitcoin golden era is coming, everyone. Give them a round of applause, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you.